Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I am very excited to announce the launch of Headstamp's second book. This is uh, Thornycroft to SA-80, A History of British Bullpup Rifles, which been, has been written by this gentleman right here, Jonathan Ferguson, who has the coolest job title of all time, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the British Royal Armories. That's, that's pretty awesome. It's pretty cool. I promise I didn't make that one up. <laughs> it's true. I've seen the sign on the door. Yeah. So we have here in front of us an EM2, which is really, I, I don't think you can argue that the EM2 is anything other than the coolest rifle made in the Cold War. Sure. Like, it's awesome. And yet it had this really short adoption. You know, its, it's lifespan was tragically cut short. Eight um, months. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. And this was not the first British bullpup. No, not by a long shot, as it turns out. Um, I don't think I fully realized how early they were until I started work on the book. Uh, we have, or will have, um, an 1860s muzzle-loading British bullpup. No kidding. Um, for, yeah, it, it's so little is known, it won't be a big feature in the book, but it's in there as like the first. Okay. So then the, the big ones, you've got the EM2 pattern. You've, of course, got the modern British bullpups, the SA-80 series. Yes. Um, <laughs> what else is in there? So we, the, the first full chapter is actually a combination of, of the Thornycroft and the Godsaw. OK. Um, partly because less is known about the Godsaw, um, and also because there's a lot of cross-pollination between those two designs. They seem mm -hmm. to be borrowing from each other. Um, they're visually very similar as well. So they. At one point, they both have an inclined bolt hmm. coming up the back on a slope, which is kind of curious, but it's yeah. all about getting your eye behind the sight. That gets revisited with the um, SA-80 mm -hmm. prototypes or mock-ups. Um, so that, that's, that's really nice. Um, we've then got there's this kind of a gap of a couple of decades where this gets sort of nice, but try again. You know, okay. <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite there. Um, although interestingly, those are the motivation is quite consistent. It's one of the themes of the book. I was going to ask you about that. Mm. Like, but well, I should say it first. Please finish on. <laughs> what are the other major elements in the book? What are the major bullpup families that you cover? Sure, tangents are a big problem with <laughs> anything in this field with these as well. Um, so yeah, so then we launch into the really World War Two. So there's a, a preamble about bullpup designs that were they were kind of experimenting with, like the sniper rifle experimental model, mm -hmm. funky pump popping grip, yeah. uh, which is kind of crazy. That's a bullpup. There's a hall rifle, which is sort of semi-mythical at this point. It exists on paper. There's a mock-up made. We don't know what happened to it. That's probably very influential, but one of the drawbacks okay. here is no one writes down what they're thinking or feeling, so you have to make some inferences, look at, look at the connections, are there any? Um, and then into the EM series in earnest, so the EM1 Corsac, sort of an LMG, sort of a heavy rifle, mm -hmm. uh, light automatic gun, as they called it at the time, okay. to confuse us all, 60 years later. Um, and then the sort of the, the EMs that, that people know, so the EM1 Thorpe rifle, EM2 Janssen rifle, um, and then there's, there's the sad tale of that, which we'll, we can get into, and you've, you've already covered very well. Then we have the, I've kind of split them into, well I have, split them into two chapters. So the, the Enfield weapon system and the SAAT hmm. proper, if you like. Okay. In reality, they're the same thing. Right, one evolves from the other. Yeah, but with like a crunching gear change of, <laughs> this is gonna cost too much, let's make it completely different. <laughs> so so it, it makes it go wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> many words have been spent on that uh, topic, not just by me. Um, yeah, so that and that brings us in theory up to date, but then there's, there's a conclusion which covers the latest development, so uh, the A3, SA80, okay. and uh, there's some kind of ramblings about where we might go in the future. Okay, so what is it about this bullpup concept that seems to, it just keeps coming up, especially in the UK. Yes. You know, there are other countries that have done bullpups, but none that have really had this this recurring path of bullpups the way the British have. Not for so long and not so consistently, yeah. I think. I mean, the, the French, as you know, went through a phase in the 50s overlapping with these, 
uh, of just, I think there were like a dozen, you know better than me, um, just trying lots of different ballpark versions of, of existing things and, and new things. So, and of course, they end up with a do pretty end up good ballpark. A very nice one. Yeah. Um, but, and in fairness, they started quite early as well, like the Focon. Um, over the shoulder thing, kind of. Yeah, I don't know how much that was official military, as opposed to a guy thinks it's neat, and there's a sketch of one and gets reprinted a lot. Yeah, well, that's that's absolutely fair. Um, although the Thornycroft and the Godsword are really in the same bracket as the hat. It's just okay. that I think they had a bit more serious consideration than the folk on. But so yeah, France and Britain are probably the two big um, advocates for for bullpup firearms in general. It seems like Britain invents the concept with this 1860s um, Riviere. Okay. Um, um, it is a rifle. It's like a bench rest rifle. So <clears throat> making a bullpup seems to have been about it being more convenient to muzzle load it. Oh, that makes sense. So that's a different motivation yeah. than just about all the others. Well, if you can try and pull it together into one piece, which is difficult, it's, it obviously it's about being compact mm -hmm. and getting as complete a powder burn as you can for range, power, sort of accuracy. So that's consistent. In terms of the role, the Thornycroft and the Godsall were for mobile infantry. So Boer War era, this is about, they're not cavalry as, as you recognize them. They're infantry who ride into battle, like, like the Dragoons right, of old and in France, um, ride to battle, jump off, and they fight as infantry. So they want something that's as capable as a rifle, but compact and can be drawn from a boot or scabbard on a it's kind of funny how, how closely that mimics the modern idea of mechanized infantry. Precisely. You're not shooting from a vehicle, but you're riding into battle on your iron horse, jumping out and fighting like infantry. Yep. If you can boil it right down, that's really what we keep trying to do okay. multiple times throughout the mostly the 20th century. But these guys come in right at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay. Now, what motivated you to do a book specifically on bullpup rifles? Because doing that, skips over, well frankly, skips over most of the actual issue British rifles because the Lee Enfields are not bullpups, the, the SLR is not a bullpup. Why specifically bullpup rifles? Good question. I've done it all wrong. I'm going to have to start again. <laughs> no, you can't. The, the books are pre-selling the book like today. <laughs> it's too okay. late to start over. Well, you know, this, you're absolutely right. And in the process of writing and editing, you, you, kind, of, you kind of want to start writing about the other stuff. Um, and I have, hopefully enough to, to put it in context. Volume, volume two, <laughs> British not bullpup rifles. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? No. Um, so really, it's just like it, it, the same as, as you would compare with foreign equivalents. <laughs> that that's as much as they appear. No. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's an artificial, arbitrary distinction, and that's really one of the conclusions I've come to and mm -hmm. kind of stated is it doesn't actually matter so much. You know, we get they're exotic, they're cool, or you hate them, depending on your point of view, and it's still exotic. And, and so we, we see them as a subset, as a distinct thing, but it's not a meaningful technical distinction. And when you look no. at the development processes of all of these and of foreign designs, in theory, they're not looking at making a ballpark. Although, in the British case, I'm pretty convinced that it becomes a cultural yearning, <laughs> almost, <laughs> once the, you know, what, what they're remembering about Thornycroft and Goldsall, I, I really can't prove. Um, and then weirdly, they, they almost try not to mention the EM2 when they're developing the EWS slash SA80. It's weird. Even though one of the designers was, was involved, hmm. in, in, he, he penned, he drew the original EWS, they mention the EM2 once, huh. as far as I can see, which is kind of crazy. And yet they, and of course, it's completely different, as you point out. As to motivation, it's kind of your fault. <laughs> well, no, there's two sides to this. Um, but one is that um, you did that great series of videos when you visited us a few years ago. Um, and I looked at doing, so I did some um, backup uh, pieces for that. So, so that, that started like, well, why don't we just keep going and make a book? Awesome. That's fantastic, yeah. So, having looked at it, we've seen some of the mock-ups that we're going through. It's, it's not completely finalized yet, but the manuscript is long since finished, um, and it's a fantastic looking book. I'm really, really excited to see this in print. 
um, and we're really excited to be launching it on Kickstarter today. So, um, as we did with my book previously, we have a couple different editions of this. We've got the standard book, um, we've got the signature edition, signed by Jonathan. Keeper, we're gonna have to get you to like sign it with the <laughs> whole title. Um, if too many people buy that, destroy your hand signing books. <laughs> Um, and, of course, a really cool specialized collector's edition um, for those of you who are really serious uh, collectors of firearms books. So um, there are also a bunch of Kickstarter perks, uh, some cool special bonuses you get for being part of the pre-sale, uh, and we have a bunch of stretch goals set up. So if we can meet a bunch of stretch goals, we can make the book even cooler uh, than, than just the content. So hopefully, I would love to see this be tremendously successful, like the trifle book. Um, I'm really excited to see it. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us about this. Sure. Um, we're gonna have some more, a couple more videos uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks, touching on a little more detail on some of the areas of the book. Uh, but in the meantime, go and check out the Kickstarter, uh, check out the different options and the you know, some cover imagery and, and mock-up imagery that we have. And uh, thanks for watching. Thank you for spending what I recognize is a tremendous amount of time writing a book about a subject like this. I'm not going to lie, it was really enjoyable. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work, but it's it's the good kind. Of work. It's the bit at the end that's that's you know, a little more challenging. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys.